your guide to the truth. The new American Media dot com. Broadcasting to you live from the Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, planet Earth, North America, the United States of America, Kentucky, Louisville to be specific. Hello everybody, my name is Brian Engelman and I am going to be your host as I have been for the past nine years here on the TNAM network because the news always matters. Follow us on the New American Media and all of the platforms that we have. We have nine years of content covering sports, current events, politics, humor, preparedness, uh, growing food, cooking food food and drink. We have a whole bunch of different groups. Follow us. Connect with us. Um, uh, Let's see. The Unhappy Hour underscore is our Twitter feed. And once we get to 100 followers on our brand new YouTube channel, we'll give it a name as well. Um, So we'll link it. So in the meantime, follow us on our cornerstone, youtube.com slash the new American Media. Also check out the new American Media.com. Uh, ready. It's overdue for a facelift, so we'll be bringing it to you. Let's run through the world of sports, shall we? <clears throat> Let's start with the Ohio State Buckeyes. <sighs> the Ohio State Buckeyes are being decimated right now. Decimated by the Big Ten. Decimated by Kevin Warren's awful leadership. Canceling the season. Postponing the season. Trying to revote. Trying to. You know what? We've lost two top ten picks now. Ohio State cornerback Sean Wade announced Monday that he's opting out of his senior season to prepare for the NFL draft. With the uncertainty of when a Big Ten season will be played, Wade has decided to forego his remaining year of eligibility and move on to the next level. A projected starter and preseason All-American, Wade was listed as the number seven prospect on the big board of ESPN's Mel Kiper Jr. earlier this month. He had been projected as an early round pick in the 2020 NFL draft, but decided to return to the Buckeyes for one more season. Quote, This has been an extremely difficult decision to make, but I know it's the right decision for me, end quote, Wade said in a video on Twitter. He continues, I am forever grateful to Buckeye Nation, looking forward to the next chapter. Ah. Had the season started like it was supposed to, he would be on our team. This is a team that has national championship aspirations. And let's be honest, if they ever decide to play again... The Ohio State Buckeyes will still have national championship aspirations, but you lose the number seven draft pick in in the NFL draft. That hurts your team. I know it's next man up. I know it's an NFL football factory at Ohio State. But you have a superstar in his prime college year, and you let him go. And it's not that you let him go. The Big Ten forced him out. There's no science backing any reason why there should not be college football this year. Look at all of the other schools playing. Look at the microscopic transmission rates of of kids, of adolescents. Let's not even forget, let's never forget, that these are kids in the peak physical condition of their lives. 18 to 22, 23-year-old kids. Division I college athletes. These are not people... uh, In general, these are people that are not battling old age, because old age is a common denominator with most of the people who have been affected and taken out by this global situation. See, I can't even say what it is or else YouTube is going to ban this video like they do with so many, because I guess independent media journalists, independent journalists, independent commentators, independent content creators, are not allowed to discuss actual current events. Everybody else can. Everybody else can get monetized. But we'll get into that later. Kids are not at high risk. I'll tell you where kids are more at risk. Dropped off on a college campus, not with the structure of a football program. Going to house parties, going to bars, going to restaurants, hooking up. What kids do, they're much safer in a strictly regimented football program. No science behind it. Kevin Warren's letting his own kid play football, not letting the Big Ten play football. And now the revolt has gotten loud, but even now they're talking about, oh, maybe we'll play after the election. Oh, really? After the election? You're going to do this after the election. And you're going to try to tell me, Kevin Warren, that this isn't political? I continue in this article. Wade Back to Sean Wade. Wade had been named a team captain for the upcoming season, whether it was scheduled to be whenever it was scheduled to be played. 
So we lose our captain in a top 10 draft pick, likely, you know, number seven on the big board. He's the second Ohio State player to opt out after offensive lineman Wyatt Davis did so three days ago. Wyatt Davis, gone. So this fantastic Buckeye team, and and look, let, let's let's be grateful that the Ohio State Buckeyes had the best draft class out of all NF uh, out of all college football last year. This year, it's so hard to even remember last year versus this year. It all seems like a big blur since March. But these are anchors. These are cornerstone players who have been in the program before who have played before, in big-time meaningful games before, who have developed and matured. This hurts. A big-name Sean Wade leaving on the defensive side. A big-name lineman Wyatt Davis doing so earlier. Crushing the Buckeyes. Painful. So let's look. Take a, let's take a step back out from just looking at the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's from, what, a couple of hours ago, this, this story? I believe so. Yeah. A couple hours ago. Big Ten schools will all move together in a decision on the football season. It's one for all and all for one. Whether the Big Ten decides to reinstate its fall sports season, it will do so collectively, Wisconsin Chancellor Rebecca Blank told reporters Monday in a rare on-the-record comment by a conference executive. I will say we're all going to move together in the Big Ten, Blank said during the teleconference audio of which the Detroit News received and reviewed. We're all going to play or not if we possibly can. This isn't going to be a school-by-school -school thing. The comments came a day after the conference's 14 presidents and chancellors met again Sunday to review updated medical data and, according to Blank, reviewed multiple proposals for a possible football season, but they didn't hold a vote. A formal vote is expected to take place at some point this week, with the Big Ten needing to flip six previous nay votes to yay in order to play football. Yay. The previous vote to postpone the season announced August 11 was 11-3, with Ohio State, Nebraska, and Iowa as the lone yays. According to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Wisconsin expected to flip this time. Blank wouldn't confirm that, saying only there are a variety of things that have changed. No, there haven't been things that have changed. What's changed... Look, it's been a frustrating sports week. The Browns got embarrassed. The, 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 the Cleveland Indians are in complete free fall. And the Buckeyes have already had their season decimated by losing two of their best players already because of this nonsense. Things have changed. What's changed? Kids were never at a high risk of this. Kids were always safer in an athletic program getting consistently tested than being dumped into a college campus. You see all, you see so many other schools playing. Things haven't changed. What's changed is the backlash from people that are sick of being told that we have to quarantine as healthy people. You should take the elderly and quarantine them. They are the most at risk. People who are obese, people with diabetes, people over the age of 75. There are clear indicators of what marks a high-risk individual. The rest of it, you know what? Things happen. Life is a risk. I could go tomorrow. You could go tomorrow. We can't bubble wrap ourselves and live in a cave. I just, I can't read this stuff. There are a variety of things that have changed. Right, things have changed. What changes is you're starting to see that we're seeing it as hollowly, transparently, Political. Governor Whitmer. Uh, Kevin Warren. I'm, I'm just going to calm down. Deep breath. Good times. <clears throat> Blank says there are a variety of things that have changed since we first made that decision. But it's unclear what other schools, if any, are prepared to join them amid a still ongoing pandemic. Michigan and Michigan State, both with presidents who are infectious disease experts in doctors Mark Schlissel and Samuel L. Stanley, respectively, voted no last time. Neither has given any indication how they'll vote this time. Asked to confirm Blake's comments that this will be an all-or-nothing proposition for the Big Ten, spokespersons for Schlissel and Stanley both declined to comment when reached by the news on Monday. Stanley hasn't spoken to reporters since just after the Big Ten's initial announcement, August 11th. And Schlissel has yet to hold a full press conference. He met individually with the student newspaper. 
quote, the Big Ten Conference will handle any announcements, end quote, a spokesman for Schlissel said in an email to the news. Blank's comments came after Sports Talk radio host Dan Patrick reported earlier Monday that the Big Ten could play on without Michigan, Michigan State, Maryland, and possibly Wisconsin. He said Ohio State, Iowa, Nebraska, Purdue, and Indiana would play. Good, just play! Play the game! This is what you exist for. You don't get these years back. You don't get do-overs. You don't just push the season. Oh yeah, we'll start in the fall or in the spring. No, you won't. You're going to start a season in... By the way, January is winter. That's not spring. Spring is spring. You're going to play in January? These NFL players, these college players preparing for the NFL are going to be in the, the combine. They're preparing for their draft status in January, February, March. They're getting drafted in April. There's not going to be a season in January. You're erasing a season. You've erased a season. You've erased a potential opportunity for the Ohio State Buckeyes to win a championship. You have ruined the opportunity for so many kids to have breakout seasons and get drafted in the NFL. Big Ten, you have screwed up royally. And you know what? Opt out. The Big Ten with more than 10 schools is a stupid name anyway. I, it, it, it's, and it's not even 20 schools. That would be the biggest 10. That would be double 10. Big Ten double time. Discount double check. It's stupid. If Ohio State needs to opt out, opt out. Leave the damn conference. Telling them they can't play. We're here to play. My idea has been to get Dwayne The Rock Johnson who just bought the XFL. Put a team in Columbus. Done. Hire the players on the team. That's your XFL team. Go semi-pro. You're semi-pro anyway. You don't need the Big Ten. The Big Ten needs Ohio State. Telling him you can't play. Figure it out. I, I just... It's very frustrating. Dan Patrick also said the presidents and chancellors would vote on Monday, but there was no indication that they had voted Monday. The Big Ten continues to face significant pressures from fans, parents, coaches, and players, even President Trump, to give 2020 football a shot. But the conference has been steadfast in that its decision won't be made by outside influences, including one active lawsuit brought by eight Nebraska players. By the way, there needs to be a class action lawsuit, not just eight Nebraska players. This should be all across the Big Ten. This is on Kevin Warren. This is on the spineless chancellors. The school administrators, the presidents, the deans, whichever people are ultimately responsible for canceling this college football season. You're not postponing it. You're canceling it. You know what you're doing? You're saying that there will be no bowl games. There will be no competition for a national championship. Well, then you tell me why these blue chip athletes are going to give a damn about your season with nothing on the line. You think they're going to play in January? You think they're going to play a season in April or May or June and miss out on next year? This was a cancellation from the beginning, not a postponement. You're going to miss out on all the bowl games and all the opportunities for the championship. What? You're just, what? The Big Ten thinks they're going to opt out and then play in January and ask the bowl games to wait until April or May to have bowl games and championships? That's never going to happen. That was never in the realm of possibility. You have taken yourself out of the running of a, of a potential championship. It is ludicrous. There needs to be class action lawsuits, not just eight people from Nebraska. <sighs> I didn't realize I was going to get so annoyed by this. But I do realize that I was going to get annoyed by this, which is why I haven't been bringing you daily content, which is why I've been so frustrated with the politici politici pol 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 politization? politization? With the injection of politics? No, I know ten other ways I can say it. Politiz po po politization? Politicalization? What is it? Is that a word? I've been so annoyed by the influx of politics into the realm of sports. It's been hard to get excited. It's been difficult to stay amped. It's been nearly impossible to have fun watching sports commenting on sports. I used to go to sports. I used to flock to sports. And you are supposed to be my welcome distraction for those things, to paraphrase Mike Polk Jr. 
it's been hard. It's been difficult to get excited for sports. And this, bailing on a season is the epitome of wedges that you will drive between your product, which is entertainment, and the fans who are furious. <clears throat> Eight Nebraska players in their lawsuit. Their attorneys received some requested documents from the Big Ten on Monday, and they said they're reviewing them before commenting. In the threat of litigation by attorneys general from Ohio and Nebraska. Instead, it'll be based on science. Oh my... This is not based on science. Science is not recommending that you cancel a season. The emergence of rapid testing is a positive there, but the still still raging, the still raging corona is a... Can I even say this on, on YouTube? I'm censoring the word. And that's the other part of it. We've been so censored, our, 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 our content, our page has been erased without explanation, without opportunity for remedy, without conversation by Facebook. The New American Media has been deleted, my personal profile deleted, under attack. And it makes it not fun to spend time creating videos, researching stories, break perspective. Why? So nobody can see it? I can't pretend that this hasn't It hasn't destroyed my willingness, my desire to break the news down for you each day, but it's made it. I've always wondered what this would have been like had I had a playing a level playing field. I don't know why some channels and some people are allowed to say what they think and why others aren't. And I haven't been able to crack the code yet. I'm not done trying. I'm a good dude, good track record, good heart, good insight, good ideas, good connections, good work ethic. I'm not done. But man, just don't tell me this is about science. Don't tell me this is about science. The world is open. Look at the Kroger workers, the Trader Joe's workers, the Speedway workers. Look at your gas stations. Look at your post office. Look at your uh, grocery stores. Look at your... Look at whatever was deemed essential. Are there massive outbreaks from these groups of people? The people that have had to work this whole time? The people that have been back for multiple months working? The economy has to go. People have to work. And we have to shed some weight. Get a little healthier, stop on the booze, get some vitamin D. Vitamin D is key. Get your sun. Take vitamin D supplements if you have to. Vitamin D might be one of the most important factors. I just I just can't read something that says, yeah, they're going to go with science. Number one, science is never settled. Number two, you don't have the opportunity to bubble wrap yourself and do this. Do a duck and cover underneath your desk in elementary school during an air raid siren until it's safe to come out. We've done that since March. It's mid-September. We have to work. We have to get back to life as normal. You want to take some basic common sense precautions? Okay. The whole masking up to walk around. If it's not an N95, it's pretty ridiculous to be walking around with a mask. But you know what? Let's do it. Let's grant a couple of concessions and get back to, to work. Get back to life. Start having events again. You are killing. How many restaurants have been destroyed and decimated and will never return? I saw a number, almost 18,000 restaurants. That's a tough industry to make it in anyway. You can't do this. Bars, restaurants, nightclubs, music venues. Think about comedians music venues, bands, musicians, performers of all kinds. Destroyed. There's no science that says you can't do half of the things that are being banned. You can't go to the beach. You can't hang out outside. People outside without a mask getting in trouble. I just, 
I gotta get through this story. <sighs> the still raging virus is a roadblock, especially on college campuses. All Michigan State students have been told to quarantine for two weeks amid an outbreak there. Wisconsin Athletics currently is shut down and has gone to remote learning for two weeks given its spike in cases. Iowa just got back from a shutdown, and Maryland, Ohio State, Rutgers, Indiana, and Michigan all have experienced football shutdowns amid outbreaks of varying degrees. Michigan shut down some sports for a while, but not football. <clears throat> Multiple football players opted out of the season before the Big Ten's August 11 announcement, including four from Michigan State and one from Michigan, citing health and safety concerns. And on Monday, Ohio State star cornerback Sean Wade opted out. Interestingly, Wade's father, Randy, had been one of the most outspoken Big Ten parents protesting the conference's postponement decision. Money won't even be the deciding factor, despite several Big Ten schools citing possible $100 million $100 million losses if the Big Ten doesn't play football. This isn't just the schools. This is concessions. This is merchandise. This is uh, food and drink. This is Uber and Lyft drivers. These are hotels. This is, this is travel. This is the economy. In Michigan State, football generates nearly $80 million of the athletic department's $140 million in revenues, with nearly $20 million coming from football ticket sales. Nearly $35 million for football TV rights, and another $1.4 million from football game day parking and concessions. <clears throat> At Michigan, football brings in more than $122 million of the department's $198 million in revenues, with about $46 million for ticket sales, $35 million for football TV rights, and $2.5 million for game day parking and concessions. Michigan State also brings in about $12 million in contributions, often from alums and often tied to football tickets. At Michigan, that figure is about $29 million. Blah, blah, blah. It continues. It doesn't continue. I'm done. <laughs> Just, I can't. I guess I'll tweet this out. Okay, so follow us at... American underscore media underscore. And I'll also do this um, at the unhappy hour underscore. All right. That's tweeted out. Check us out there. Moving on. Because I, I just, I can't with this anymore. Because part of what you have to wonder, there are coronavirus up outbreaks, right? That's the story. How many of the people don't even know they have it? A lot. Why is that? Because there are no symptoms. None. Out of the people that get it, what is it like? Similar to experiencing flu-like symptoms. How many college students have died? Why wasn't that a part of the story? People that are so concerned about the number of people that have this. Viruses rage through the world all the time. You don't shut down for them. The CDC revised their data to say that out of the roughly 180,000 people that have died of coronavirus, they said, well, let's be more accurate. Oh, now you want to be accurate. Now you want to be more accurate. Okay, CDC, let's talk about it. Out of the 180,000 people that they said died of coronavirus, they revised the number to say roughly only about 9,000 people died from coronavirus which is a big number. <clears throat> That's a lot of people. But you have to now compare a population the size of this country and compare it to smoking, drinking, automobile accidents, heart disease, diabetes. Go down the list. There's many things that kill many people every year that we never shut society down for. Roughly 9,000 people died of coronavirus, but the other people had comorbidities or multiple comorbidities that made it happen. 
is this the new information that you suddenly have? Big Ten. Mm. Good times. Well, I'll get to the Cleveland Browns in a second, but I'll just bounce through and tell you. I guess there's a there's a there's an NBA season. I was eating dinner with friends, and it was on September 11th. And I glanced up at the TV, and there was a basketball game on September 11th. And during the national anthem, I'm watching these basketball players kneeling. And the Marxist organization, not the sentiment, yes, Black Lives Matter, of course, Black Lives Matter. People that are trying to tell you that they don't, I don't know who these people are. Yes, Black Lives Matter. The movement the Marxist movement and ideology and the violent tactics of this Marxist movement are off-putting, to say the least. And to glance up and see this happening during the National Anthem on September 11th. Um, it's off-putting. <laughs> Trying to think if I was eating dinner on Saturday. I'm trying to be as accurate as I can. I feel like it was Friday. Yeah, I feel like it was Friday. I'm just trying to be accurate. If if it was Saturday, I want to want to remember it that way. But I'm I'm pretty pretty certain it was Friday the 11th. And by the way, you see two cops suffer an apparent assassination attempt. I'm getting. I am past. The point of outrage at this constant villainization of the police force. I'm over it. Completely over it. There are some cases where people need to be held accountable, but not every instance and not every circumstance is outrageous. The general public at large never has the necessary information that you need to make a rational decision in a split second when you watch a viral video. And this thing that's happened now, where there's, it's been encouraged and allowed to burn cities down and execute police officers because you've been constantly told by people like LeBron James that you're scared of police. We are way past. We are way past. We're way past a point that this narrative. We are way past the point of, of this narrative serving a valid purpose. There were, what was it, five or six cops who were executed in Dallas with a BLM, an angry BLM protester. Six cops. Another assassination attempt. Just completely, oh, because you're wearing a uniform. That's a hate crime. If you hate someone for their religion, for what they look like, what they're dressed like, that's a hate crime, right? And I've always hated the term hate crime. <clears throat> but if you hate someone because of what they are, where they work, who they worship, what clothing they wear, like that's a hate crime. Burning cities down? I'm trying to I'm trying to gauge my words carefully cuz it's very frustrating. The narratives that have been pushed since back pretty much the beginning, maybe the, I I can't recall exactly what year it got really bad. Probably Mike Brown and Kaepernick and Barack Obama. But Obama was he was also doing the the uh the Cambridge police uh, they, they they acted stupidly, had no information, and it started this trend of blaming police, of 
<clears throat> vilifying. There was Trayvon, which was a self-defense shooting. There was Mike Brown, which was a self-defense shooting. And then cities were burning, and LeBron's wearing a hoodie and standing in solidarity with Trayvon. That dude attacked a guy and got shot in self-defense. There was a trial. There were witnesses. Mike Brown robbed a store, walking down the middle of a street, attacked a cop, reached for his gun, ran away, stopped, turned around, put his head down, and charged at him. Massive human being. Yeah, you shoot in self-defense. And cities burn because of it. Now, Freddie Gray, all right, yeah, maybe. But there was even evidence in that case that was a little convoluted. Uh, Tamir Rice. Hey, man, that kid did nothing harmful to anybody. <clears throat> yeah, he was aiming his gun. It was not smart. But you don't need to show up and blow smoke. Look, I don't want to legislate all these things again. But over and over and over, the media, the Democratic Party, and the sports industrial complex, they want hatred, they want division, and they want to co-opt this movement, which sounds good. Remember the Patriot Act? Hey, we're all patriots. Oh, but Snowden told us that's all... You're illegally collecting our data and spying on us. Well, there's the Fourth Amendment. You can't do that. That's wrong. That's bad. So it sounds good, the Patriot Act, but it's not. Black lives matter. Of course they matter. Yes. I'm sorry you feel like you don't, but you do to me. And you do to everyone I know. But the movement is not. And, and to try to turn on a basketball game and see all this crap, I don't want Marxist ideology, Marxist indoctrination when I'm trying to enjoy a game. Not interested. I'm not interested in it. <clears throat> anyway, turned on a game and it really bugged me. Seeing a Marxist organization painted on the, on the court all of these slogans perpetuating this, this false narrative that is not borne out by statistics. So, that's basketball, right? In the world of basketball, the Miami Heat and the Boston Celtics are in the Eastern Conference Finals. And they tip off tonight, Game 1. Meanwhile, in the Western Conference... The Denver Nuggets are playing the Los Angeles Clippers in a Game 7 for the opportunity to meet LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and the Lakers. So, if you are still excited about basketball, there's that. Moving on to other news, if you're still excited about baseball, I, I was trying to. I haven't liked losing the team logo and going with generic Cleveland on the jerseys. I didn't like the early season social justice antics. The Marxist ideology. I don't like Marxism or communism or socialism. I'm not a fan. But capitalism raises. That's a rising tide that raises all boats. That's freedom and opportunity. That's what makes this country great. So stop demonizing this country. It's something that is being pushed by the, the China, by the Chinese, Russian. Th th there's a few groups out there that want to sow division and discord in this country. Th th they want chaos. They want this system to seem flawed and awful and racist and evil. Because then we have a civil war on our hands. And you know what? It makes us real easy to pick off and mess with when we're fighting each other. <clears throat> You're being played. You're being played. But I've been trying to be excited for baseball. Shane Bieber's look great for the Cleveland Indians. And the 2020 MLB playoffs are less than two weeks away. Even though it only seems like yesterday the regular season kicked off, the compressed 60-game schedule is rapidly coming to a close, and the MLB standings are tight heading into the finish with wildcard positioning, postseason seeding, and the rest of the playoff picture at stake. <clears throat> New look playoffs, expanded playoff format, 16 teams for the first time in Major League Baseball history. 
So, the Indians are picking a wonderful moment to have a six-game losing streak. Right now, we have slipped to number eight. That's the last team in the playoffs. Set to face the number one White Sox if it started today. So the Indians are tied with the Blue Jays and the Yankees with nine as the magic number to reach the playoffs. So, look, it is what it is. I mean, Shane Bieber has looked absolutely incredible. He's worth watching. No, what's this? And you know what? I just, I, I really hope, I really hope the Indians can do something. I hope the Tribe can win a title with Frankie. Francisco Lindor. I, you know, like, like the ownership group says, enjoy him. And you know why they say that? Because they know they're not going to re-sign him. They can't re-sign him. 2016 was up 3-1. I mean, that was right there. We could taste it. And we lost it. <clears throat> so, anyway, it, this is it. Like, we're in the playoff hunt right now. I, it, it all feels weird, but I would rather have weird sports back than not having sports back. See the previous commentary on the Big Ten. So the Cleveland Browns, I've been holding off on this because I was beyond disappointed with this on Sunday. I had to take yesterday and digest it. I was going to go live last night and figured I'd just get up a little early and do one today. The Cleveland Browns lost 38-6. to it, 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 There wasn't much. <clears throat> wasn't much to offer. Um, David Njoku looked good, caught a touchdown pass, and then he injured himself. So he's going to be out, what are they saying, at least three weeks? I guess injured himself. That's just kind of a weird way to say that. He got injured. Baker Mayfield, I don't know. I saw passes that weren't really... Some of them looked good. Some of them didn't. The running game looked good. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt looked good. Kareem Hunt's getting a few too many carries, though. I don't know why. You got a workhorse in Chubb. I, I, I want you to ride that. Uh, running back by committee, I, I, I'm not excited for that. Um, Austin Siebert? Austin Seibert? Austin, see you later, Bert. Cleveland Browns have cut their kicker and re-signed former kicker Cody Parkey. Ah, uh, cutting a player after week one, he he missed an extra point attempt. Dude, I mean that's like the easiest part of your job, and you've you've missed several last year too. Fifth round pick on this guy, gone. Deuces. Um. It's too early to say there's dysfunction in Berea. It's too early to say that Stefanski's game plan didn't work. It's it or uh, that his strategy and his coaching style isn't going to work. It's one game, and it's a shortened preseason. So the Browns haven't had a traditional opportunity during the off season to get together to to work out the kinks. You know, when you look across the league. Uh, look across our division, rather. You got the Bengals. You know, there's been turnover there. You know, post Marvin Lewis, it's new. Um, you know, Andy Dalton's out, so it's a new new quarterback with Joe Burrow over there. But if you look at the teams that have been successful, because <clears throat> since he hasn't been successful, since he hasn't been successful, that sounds like uh, something you would you would say on a microphone to get the. To set the levels right. Since he hasn't been successful. Try some cinnamon in your chili and cincy. Try some cinnamon in your chili and cincy. That's easy. But if you look at Harbaugh and the Ravens. If you look at Omar Epps. And the Steelers. That's a consistent organization. 
you plug and play new players, but the system remains. There's continuity. I know Lamar Jackson's a new quarterback, but having a stable coaching staff helps ease that process. The Browns have not had that. I know we're supposed to give give some time. I know we're supposed to wait before we jump to any any conclusions. Um, but it was pretty disappointing. It was pretty disappointing. So the good part is this. We get to play Cincinnati, who got the number one pick last year with Joe Burrow, quarterback, for a reason. Because they weren't very good. Um, they've obviously had a, an inflection of, of talent. Influx of talent? Inflection? Influx of talent? That's twice now. I'm trying. I'm like jumbling words saying, is that a word? Influx of talent. I know influx of talent is something you say. But they're young. And they're a beatable team. You can't take a single game for granted. But look, the Cleveland Browns play Thursday night, nationally televised Thursday night game. In a way, that sucks because you go from no hitting to a lot of hitting. Then you don't get the necessary recoup time to kind of get your body right. You just got to go out and play again. In a way, that stinks. But in another way, that's great. In another way, hey, you have an opportunity to get out there and fix what you weren't able to do right the first time. You're able to get out and get a win. Suffer a loss, go for a win, you could be one and one. And then you have a long week to prepare for your next opponent. If we can be one and one with an extended week of preparation, With a new coach, I'm not happy about that, but I, I, could, I, could, I could find reasons to stay positive and optimistic about that. I mean, 0-2 is something I can't even think about. Because that, like I said, it's been getting harder and harder for me to stay excited about sports. And I played sports my whole life. I followed sports my whole life. I've collected sports stuff. I, I just, I like sports. I really enjoy watching it, participating in it, <clears throat> covering it, playing fancy football, talking about it, comparing stats, uh, telling you the keys to the game, the breakdown, the, the key moments of, of what changed the trajectory of whether it's basketball or baseball or football. I, like, I, I love it. I love it. I used to love it. I used to love it. I'm trying to stay loving it. But you know, my peeps over there in the unhappy hour, I, I haven't seen you in a while. Because I, I had been putting most of my energy into that platform in the group. I guess it's still there. I'm not running anymore. I've been deleted with no explanation. Ah. So it's frustrating on a social media level. It's frustrating on a social justice level. And it's frustrating on a performance level, perhaps mo first and foremost. That's the most frustrating part. So I'm doing the – look, guys, guys, girls, everybody, I I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying to still give you the content. That you come here for. I'm, I'm still trying to connect with you. I'm still trying to break it down and provide some sort of insight that gives you value in your day. I've just had to, uh, I've had to make some changes. So follow us on Twitter at American underscore media underscore. As for our general page, we're going to find a lot of uh, current events and politics on there right now. For sports, go to at the unhappy hour underscore. Once again, we will be rebuilding. Once I find this new rhythm on the newamericanmedia.com, youtube.com slash the new American media, click subscribe. Um, but please follow us on our YouTube channel if you haven't yet. 
I don't have a name for it. I'll just I'll share it through the Facebook page. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll share. I've said that so many times. I'll share it through our Twitter feed. So if you can please lick, <clears throat> like and subscribe, like and subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. So. Anyhow, and look, we're going to do more Greedy Disagree shows. We're going to book more guests. We're going to get back to doing that. That was the cornerstone of what we did. But honestly, it's, it's been a pretty toxic couple of years with the fake impeachment scams and, you know, the, the phony collusion stories, the Russian nonsense. It's in the media. The, the media has been unbearable. People on social media have been become unhinged. It's taken a lot of the fun out of covering that stuff, too. I've disconnected a little bit. But you know what? It's like that scene in, what is that, Office Space about Michael Bolton? He says, why should I change my name? He's the one that sucks. <laughs> why should I stop doing what I'm doing? The social media companies suck. The out professional outrage artists and the panic porn people of social media, they suck. I don't suck. We're trying to balance common sense, reality, fact, and nuance. I don't want my sports to be woke and Marxist. I want it to be awesome. And I want players to continue working in their communities to make society a better place. But all too often what I've seen with sports is a willingness to demonize with a broad, sweeping stroke, law enforcement is evil. And that leads to assassinations. That leads to chaos. That leads to cities burning. Ineffectual Democrat mayors. Lightfoot in Chicago. Oh, geez, what are all these people? Newsom's bad, but for, well, I guess if we're talking governors, we're talking mayors. I've seen ridiculous restrictions in Minnesota. I'm sorry, Michigan, California, Oregon. I'm tired of seeing cities burning. This movement, this BLM Antifa hybrid of chaos, the murder, the property damage, the destruction, the chaos, the threats, the intimidation, the assaults. This movement has jumped the shark. This movement... has entrenched itself. It scrambled the eggs together with the sports world. The same sports world that demonized Tim Tebow for taking a knee. Remember, can you can we remember back that far? Because he believed in a in a higher power that maybe humanity was created in the image of a god in trying to take a solemn moment after a touchdown to take a knee and say a quick prayer of thank you. If you recall, that was demonized by ESPN and the left-wing media. It's hard to remember back that far, but it happened. And then to do such a 180 where now you're all about kneeling to disrespect America, to talk trash about America, to only look through the, the rearview mirror of the past of America and ignore the awesome future and opportunity we have right now. We're on a freeway driving 70 miles an hour forward. But the Marxists in BLM and Antifa, the athletes who are being played and manipulated by the legacy media and the Democratic Party for political purpose, want to stare in the rearview mirror, in the side mirrors, and ignore what's ahead of us. It's disingenuous, it's deceptive, it's chaos, it's anarchy, it's destructive to our republic. You know, there were frustrated people back in, during the Tea Party movement, if you can think back that far. You know what? Never burned buildings down, assembled, never blocked traffic. Never 
got up in people's faces screaming and frothing at them while they're dining in a restaurant. Never walked up and shot a supporter of, of a different political party like they did in, in it was Portland, right? Not Seattle. It's all blurring together a little bit. Would have hundreds of thousands of people show up for events. They would leave and they would leave the parks cleaner than the way they found them. Look across our country now. Look at the carnage. Look at the chaos. Look at the spray paint. Look at the broken glass. Look at the looting. Look at the stores that are not coming back that will never come back. When you loot in a city, when you burn things down, business, industry, taxpayers, they flee and they don't return for a long time, many decades. This is not helping anything. And the last thing I want, when I'm trying to turn on a game and take my mind away from the stuff I'm seeing online, the stuff I'm seeing on the news, the last thing I want is more of the stuff that's creating all the turmoil in the streets, on the news. I don't want to see it in, on the sports field. I want equality. I want freedom. I want justice. I want liberty. I want racial equality. I don't want Marxism. I don't want communism. I don't want socialism. I don't want these failed ideologies to replace what we have. And it's becoming painfully clear that the agendas of many of the organizers, the people involved in this, and look up BLM if you, if you don't understand why I keep saying Marxist, and cultural Marxism. Look it up. Trained Marxists are behind this BLM movement. You're being played. You're being lied to. You're being manipulated. You're being force-fed constant rage so you can cut off your own nose to spite your face. It's, it's, it's not a good look. It's not good for humanity. It's not good for sports. Look at the ratings. The ratings are way down. I still like sports. I thought sports was supposed to unite us. It's one of the things I like the most about sports. And I don't know if LeBron is misguided or if he's in on it. I don't know. I don't know how we fix this or if we can. You know, we had our September 11th thing last week. <clears throat> and it reminds me of, you know, September 12th. And then shortly after, I drove with my girlfriend at the time. to Manhattan, and we, we hosted a benefit, a, a fundraiser in my college with my band and the best bands in town, and raised $1,471, I believe, a donation only at the door, and the show was held when half the students were gone, it was like a fall break or something, so they weren't even on campus, so I was able to walk in and give the Red Cross like a stack of cash, just here you go, just try to help, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to do wanted to help but I felt united on September 12th 2001 and there was the typical <clears throat> there was the typical uh, politicization polit is this the same word having trouble with? I think I've said this twice now. Politiza politization? With George W. Bush, there was the usual politics involved. Um, you know, left and right, and then obviously war, you know, we were attacked, and so then we didn't attack Saudi Arabia, we attacked Iraq and Afghanistan. So then you get into the New World Order, you get into constant global warfare. You know, there were big government concerns and 
that type of stuff. It was easier to go get somebody after we were attacked in, in such a vile way. But the scope of the military industrial complex, like that was obviously a part of it. But we were united on September 12th. We were in America. We were all on the same team. And somewhere during the Obama years, we something changed. You know, th this country, it was super quick. <laughs> you know, not if you were living during that hundred years, obviously, but comparatively to other nations that had had practices such as slavery. From the inception in 1776, no, we didn't start in 1611. D enough for that. The, that's been debunked as pure propaganda. We can talk about that at another topic or at another time, another show. <clears throat> we have covered that a little bit, but it's from 1776 to 18, what was it, 63? I don't remember off the top of my head. This nation got rid of that practice pretty darn quick and fought a bloody revolution to do so. This is a great place. And there's been a complicated history. There's been atrocities for sure. But in 2020, we have a pretty level playing field if you stay off drugs, stay off alcohol, if you're not having kids before you're married, if you're getting through high school, you have a pretty great likelihood of never being poor and having an equal opportunity to kick ass at life. You can kind of be whatever you want in this country. We've seen it. Entertainers, athletes, scientists, politicians, writers. I mean, pick, pick any industry. There's no industry that you are shut out of today if you put your head down and work and you do well. And you make some decent decisions. If you make bad decisions, hey, every bad decision is going to drop your likelihood of success rapidly. So when I see athletes only pushing that, yeah, cops are bad, cops are evil, I'm scared of cops, Cop cops are the problem, evil cops. What I see in many of these instances, so many that, that the media has created, uh, created a, that they've amplified, that they've used their megaphone to Stoke the fuel, stoke the fire with fuel of hatred and anger. So many of these cases are about people fighting cops. If you don't like the cops, okay. If you've run into a cop that was a jerk, hey. Mm -hmm. If you feel like a cop has treated you unfairly, that right here. But when you fight a cop like Eric Garner, when you fight a cop like Mike Brown, when you fight, I, I'm not going to go down the laundry list. I'm so tired of this. The point is, where is the outreach? And if these multimillionaire athletes care so much, how about the outreach instead of villani villainizing, vilifying? It's the third or fourth time I've combined words. Vilifying. The entire group of people, which I believe is stereotyping, which I believe is something we're not supposed to do. I digress. How about set up a legal defense fund where if you feel you've been wrongly <clears throat> you had an interaction that was a wrongful arrest and you were treated unfairly, how about a legal defense fund and a public outreach campaign to not attack cops, to not burn down cop cars, to not burn down police stations, to not burn down your cities, to not fight with cops, to live another day and work it out in the justice system. There's, if there's things you want to tweak about the justice system, guess what? You have a president that's changed. There was significant criminal justice reform, and that is something that was supposed to be unifying, if we can recall back that far. 
How about an outreach program to make sure that you don't attack people? <clears throat> because we have a right to self-defense in this country. If you want to talk about no-knock raids and Breonna Taylor, number one, you better learn the case. Because I live here in Louisville and I've been talking to people in Louisville. I've been talking to reporters who have interviewed people. The story you're being told is not quite accurate. That house was on the, the search warrant. That house was a hotbed of drug trafficking activity. And there were a lot of bad decisions that were involved in how that played out. But none of us are legal, legal experts. Especially most of the goons in Antifa and BLM that are out there causing violence. They're either being paid, they're bored, they're gangs of roving criminal vagabonds. They're not legal defense experts. You know, there were the outpouring of outrage after watching the George Floyd video of peaceful people saying this is wrong was beautiful until it got violent and destructive. But this is continued. This isn't about that anymore. This is about many different things. This is about throwing away the American way of life and replacing it with Marxism. I'm not on board with that. But how about a legal defense fund from these athletes to say, hey, it is never a smart idea to attack the police, to wrestle with the police, to try to shoot the police with a taser, to try to reach inside your 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 vehicle for a weapon after you've been wrestling with officers, after you've been, after 911 call has been placed on you because you'd raped that lady before, that Jacob Blake. Once again, I don't want to get in the weeds with all these cases. that They all start blurring together. And very few of them are cut and dried, obviously heinous. How about a public outreach campaign to not destroy your city and explain the damage that that caused? And a public outreach campaign to say, hey, we're setting up a legal defense fund. If you feel like you are in a jackpot situation from bad police work, you've been targeted, you've been misrepresented, presented, you need help, how about help those people? And do a public service campaign to stop fighting police when you're getting arrested. Because now you're seeing it more and more. You've seen police across this country getting assaulted with rocks and bricks and sticks and pipes and Molotov cocktails and all sorts of things. Assassination attempts, straight up murders. This is the result of poor messaging, especially from you athletes. It's not about villainizing the police industry, the police profession. And I agree, I agree that the police should not be professional shakedown artists, just haha, caught another one, they turn you upside down and shake money out because they have quotas to fill. And that was something when I talked with ben, journalist Ben Swan after uh, Ferguson, that it wasn't really about Mike Brown, it was about people feeling like there were outsiders who didn't live in the community, who worked in the community of Ferguson. They built these massive buildings, uh, structures off of all of the people who had been shaken down for little piddly stuff. You know, what we need police for is to stop violence. Criminals, thieves, arsonists, murderers, rapists, all these things. We shouldn't be having quotas to, to make it feel like you have an occupying force shaking money out. When, there, when, when there's a possibility, when there's an opportunity in this world to... de-escalate a situation, that should be the protocol from the police. But de-escalation is only going to work if the public is not going to be aggressive toward the police. Because too many police have been killed in the line of duty. Can't deny that. Innocent, good people killed. Just like these athletes are saying, innocent, black people are being killed. You see the dichotomy here. You see the interwoven contradictions of this. I want a respectful society. I want a free society. If we want to work on some 
actual policing changes, tweaks, adjustments, training that will evolve what policing is in America? I'm all about having that conversation. I want that conversation. I'll demand that conversation. Because I've seen it. I've seen it where police are too aggressive. They, they're looking for a fight when what they need to be doing is letting the air out of a tense situation. But when you become violent, when you're burning things down, when you're assaulting the cops, when you're when it, when it's when it's burning and looting and rioting, no, that's not peaceful. There aren't peaceful rioters, peaceful protests. No, this hasn't been peaceful since it started. That 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 argument is gone. But these aren't the conversations we're getting in the sound bites and the clips and the video montages. And it's turned me off of the sports world big time. But look, I'm not going to give up because it's not, I fight, I struggle, I struggle like, like, like so many people. I, I, we all have moments where we just, we, we, we want to stop. You know, we just want to stop. It's throw up your hands. Somewhere along the way, I picked up on the fact that it's probably not a good idea to be a quitter. So how about I hold out a little hope? that we can reframe what this conversation has become into something that can actually unite us. Because this is really divisive. This is really bad. And it feels very political, which just takes away the credibility of it. I think there's... No, I don't think. I know that there's more that unites us than there is that divides us. And I think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see that in the election. I, I, I think this divisive racial politics, I think it will get soundly trounced. That's my guess. Could be right, could be wrong. I think you've seen it in the polls. The, the nationwide chaos and the lack of protection from elected officials from the left who think that Hey, if cities burn, if people are attacked, if businesses are destroyed and vandalized, that, that this will make President Trump look bad, so we're going to let it happen and we're not going to have allow the police to stop this? I think you've seen the country terrified, appalled, shocked, disgusted that the left would be willing to cut off their nose to spite their face. So, <laughs> you coming up? Let's see if I can get Mr. Ben to come up. He'll, he'll say hi. Come, here. come on. Well, don't me off. You're not going to come up. Let's see if I can get him on camera. Come here. Come on, bud. He's not really a big, he's not big into getting picked up. So, let's see if we can get him on camera. Come here. So be anticlimactic if you don't jump, Mr. Bean. There he is. There he is. You're on camera, bud. See, life should be about love. This guy, Mr. Ben, he was my Los Angeles buddy. Him and his three siblings showed up on my porch and started sleeping there. I know it doesn't get super cold in L.A. Whoop. Don't give me your butt. <laughs> they don't want to see that. But, Mr. look, and I'll end it with this. Mr. Bean's a good example. You know, I I adopted Mr. Bean. Ben. Mr. Ben. Beanie boy. Him and his three siblings. Shebound, Aster, and Leto. They're sleeping on the porch, and I brought them in. Looked like they needed help. They did. A lot of those outdoor cats don't last long. And brought him in. I've been caring for him ever since. Uh, adopted out Leto first. 
pretty quickly. Then I adopted Shebe's out. Uh, to my friend Kevin. Kevin had uh, needed a place to stay. Came down from San Francisco and stayed on the couch with us in Los Angeles for supposed to be a few weeks or a few months. It turned into a few years. Um, but you know what? People lean on each other. You know, people need help from time to time. I adopted a foster kid next door. He needed help. You know, I guess adopted is the wrong word. I fostered, I fostered the neighbor boy. Um, there were circumstances and he needed help. I knew him since he was five. He was 10 years old and he had nowhere to go. They're going to throw him into foster care and couldn't even finish out his final school year because he was going from elementary to middle school the next year. And I said, dude, come on, just come on in. Let's make this work. I'll take care of you. I'll do the best I can. I, I wasn't, I didn't anticipate this happening, but let's, let's do our best. I think America is a place where you try to help people. You try to help those closest to you. So let's focus on that. Let's try to focus on helping people. Thanks, Mr. Ben, for that segue. I appreciate you, buddy. Anyway, I got to run. Hope you got something out of this today. I think I did. Sometimes I just got to talk to kind of... Sometimes I don't know what I'm thinking until I start talking. Maybe that's true with all of us, so... Comment below. Tell me what you think about all this. To be continued. Love you guys. Peace.